inside the pores between the cells. The body thinks it's bacteria. The body's immune system becomes activated. The body oxidizes it. In other words, it, it attacks it. It attacks it with oxygen things like superoxide, the mutase, and all these things. It tries to kill it with oxygen molecules. When it becomes oxidized, it changes the shape of the molecule, turns into a nasty glob called a foam cell. It expands. These can't get back into the bloodstream very well. The body's immune system keeps attacking it, and it keeps making more and more of these. The body tries to remodel the artery by building endothelium around it to make it smooth again. The, the arteries do not like rough surfaces. The bodies like to be smooth. So any rough surface, the, the body will try to remodel it, make it smooth by, by coating it with endothelium. Now the body remodels and it keeps building this, this fibrous cap. It's called a fibrous cap where it coats with endothelium. If, if this keeps getting bigger and bigger, which sometimes it does, the amount of the artery left for blood flow gets real small. The lumen, the inside of the artery is called the lumen or the inside of any blood vessel is called the lumen. If you have a garden hose, the part where the water goes through, that's called the lumen. If you have plaque, let's take a heart artery, and let's say you have a plaque that covers about 50%. Now, the only place the blood can go through is this half of the artery. This half is gradu, nasty stuff. It's, all, it's blocked. So now the artery is only half of the size. The lumen is only half the size it was. Is that a problem? Yeah, it can be a problem, especially when you exercise. Now, the heart is extremely efficient. Your heart is a lot better than it needs to be. It's so much better than it needs to be that you can get by on like 20% of a lumen as long as you don't do anything really physical. You can have a, you can have a heart artery 80% blocked and still do just about every activity you want to do as long as it's not really exertional. You won't be able to you know, run into Catalan or run a mile. But you'll be able to walk down the street. You can, I, you can probably go upstairs too. If it gets more than about 80%, you'll start developing symptoms, especially when you do any physical activity. The symptoms, like we discussed, I think, once before, the symptoms of a blocked heart artery is called angina or angina. Plaque tends to occur where arteries divide for several reasons. One, if you look at, uh, when we were talking about turbulence, if you, if you have a straight artery and you put pressure, if you look in the middle of a hose and watch the water go through a hose, if you were to measure the velocity of the flow, it's highest in the middle, and as you get near the wall, it slows down because there's an interaction between the molecules on the edge and the surface. There's friction. Anytime two surfaces are in contact, there's friction. Friction slows down the speed of the particles and the farther you are away from the side, the less it's affected, so the middle goes faster. And, that's, and this is symmetrical, so it's shaped like a cone. Okay? The middle goes the fastest, the outside goes the slowest. That's called laminar flow. If you change direction, or if you, if you have something poking into the hose, like a plaque, or if you just change direction, it disrupts laminar flow because because of Newton's first law, where things, if, you, if something has to change direction, it has to be accelerated. So, if blood is going straight, and now it has to turn a corner, that, that's, that's a form of acceleration. So what, what happens is it causes turbulence. If you listen to somebody with a blockage, you'll hear something called a brewery, which is, you can hear the turbulence. And as the blood accelerates through there and it hits a rough area and the blood spins, it creates just like rapids in a creek. If water goes over a rock, you can hear it. Same thing here. As the body is remodeling, number one cause of heart attacks, plaque rupture, thrombus formation, and a blocked artery. And someone has plaque disease. You see why blood clotting is so important in understanding coronary artery disease. That's why cardiologists are going to have to understand blood clotting in the next 20 years if they want to keep their practice open because there are so many things that affect clotting. And a lot of people have clotting disorders. goes into each form of shock separately. We will talk about each form of shock and how it affects how shock begins. Now, the way I... In this, in this lecture... They're going to divide shock, and you're going to talk about cardiogenic shock, then you're going to talk about anaphylactic shock, then you're going to talk about septic shock, neurogenic shock, obstructive shock. But in the body, they all basically do the same thing. 
And if you notice here, like right, um, here's cardiogenic shock starts here, septic shock starts here, neurogenic shock starts here, hypovolemic shock starts here. But when they get going, they all do the same thing and they're all interacting. So that's okay, we're going to talk about some terms. Preload, afterload, peripheral vascular resistance, or PVR, stroke volume, uh, cardiac output. What's preload? How much blood goes into the heart? Right. Remember I said if the sphinx is turned on and you get a glass and fill up and then dump it, fill it up, dump it. Preload is the amount of water coming out of the spigot. And by changing the heart rate, you're not going to affect the amount coming in. You have to do something else to affect the amount coming in. Or just ma making the glass go faster is not going to increase the amount of water you're pouring out. But that's preload. The amount of blood available to go into the heart. Unless you're in congestive heart failure, the preload determines the cardiac output. The heart is passive. The heart just pumps out whatever comes into it. If you have a healthy heart, if your heart's not damaged, your heart will pump out whatever comes into it up to about seven times normal. If, you, if your venous return increases 30%, your cardiac output will increase 30%. If your venous return doubles, your cardiac output will double. If your venous return increases four times normal, your cardiac output will go to four times normal. Automatically, it's just boom, 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 boom. What's afterload? It's how much resistance there is to flow coming out of the heart. Afterload is, is the resistance to blood being pumped out of the heart into the arteries. The more arteries that are constricted, the more afterload, the more basal constriction, the more peripheral, peripheral vascular resistance. How difficult it is for the heart to empty into the arteries. There you go. Peripheral vascular resistance. The, the, the amount of impedance to the heart pumping into the arteries. And that's proportional to the basal constriction. The more vessels are constricted, the harder it is to pump blood into the arteries. If you dilate the arteries, then it makes it easier for the heart to pump, so there's less work the heart has to do. What's the stroke volume? It's the amount of blood that the heart pumps out each time it squeezes. And that is related to something called the ejection fraction, or EF. Ejection fraction is the amount of emptying that the heart does when it squeezes. If a heart, let's say the ventricle has 200 cc's of blood when it gets ready to contract. Does it pump out 200 cc's of blood? No. no. The heart never pumps out all the blood that's in it. It's just, it's just not built where it can do that. When a heart pumps, it pumps about 60 to 65 percent of the blood that's in it if the heart's healthy and not damaged. And that's called the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is the percent of the amount of blood in the heart that pumps out with each beat. A normal ejection fraction is greater than 55 percent. Anything greater than 55 percent. Usually it's 60 to 65 percent. So stroke volume and ejection fraction are, are closely linked. Stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. Stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. Normal is about five liters a minute. If you slightly, if you slightly stretch a muscle, it works better. Skeletal muscles do the same thing, but the cardiac muscle especially. If you take the heart muscle and infuse an extra 20 cc's of blood in between heartbeats, the next stroke volume will be stronger. The heart actually responds to slightly higher pressures by being more efficient and pumping stronger. It has to do with how many actin and myosin filaments overlap when you slightly stretch your muscle. The heart becomes more efficient. And that's a good thing because if, if your system were to, slight, were to slightly become overloaded and, and too much blood was to come into the heart, it would be a good thing if your heart could say, oh, more blood, boom, boom, boom. That's a good thing. So uh, the fact that Frank Starling exists is good because your heart can compensate easier if too much blood starts coming into the heart. So that's called the Frank Starling effect. It's basic hemodynamic principle. The greater the volume of preload, the more ventricle stretch. And that's the Frank Starling effect. Catecholamines enhance cardiac contractility and strength. And what are the catecholamines? Epinephrine, norepinephrine, and then the brain dopamine. But it, for our practical purposes, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Afterload, the resistance against which ventricle must contract the injury. Hypoperfusion. Perfusion is how much good blood goes through a tissue. So if a tissue is being perfused, that implies that oxygenated blood is going to where it needs to go. That's tissue perfusion. Everybody always memorizes in EMT class, shock is inadequate tissue perfusion. Everybody knows that. Everybody gets 100 on, on that question. Then you turn around and say, describe perfusion. They go, they didn't tell me I didn't know that. They just told me I had, to, I had to memorize that definition. So perfusion is how well oxygenated blood is going into the tissue that needs the oxygen. That's perfusion. If you cut off perfusion, 
then the tissue becomes ischemic. What's ischemic? Without oxygenated blood flow to the tissue. Every tissue needs to be perfused. So uh, inadequate tissue perfusion means just whatever tissue you're talking about doesn't get enough arterial blood flow. Now, certain tissues can survive that longer. You can, you can cut off the blood supply to the skin for a couple hours and it won't die. But if you cut off the blood supply to the heart and brain for more than four or five minutes, you're in deep <coughs> So how long a tissue can go without perfusion depends on the, the nature of the tissue. The higher the metabolic rate, the shorter the time it can survive. And what tissues have the highest metabolic rate? The brain. The brain, the brain uses more oxygen than any other tissue in the body. It's like 6% of your mass, it takes like 20% of the arterial blood supply. So those numbers may be a little bit off, but the brain uses more oxygen and blood than any other organ. So those are the organs least tolerable to ischemia because they use oxygen at a very high rate. They need a constant supply. And if you don't have it, things go bad very quickly. Okay, here we go. Stroke volume times the heart rate equals cardiac output. We just talked about that. Blood pressure dependent on cardiac output, peripheral vascular resistance. Now you remember your blood pressure, you're measuring if the pump, if the pump is here. Here's the arteries, let's say we'll make three of them. Here's the pump, here's the aorta, right? You're measuring the blood pressure, let's say in the arm, which is, so if these, if these arteries out here get constricted, what's gonna happen to the pressure here? Kink off the hose, the pressure between the pump and the kink goes up. So if the peripheral vascular resistance is high, your arterial pressure, your blood pressure is gonna be high. So people with high blood pressure often have a high peripheral vascular resistance. A dissection is related, there's two, there's several types of aneurysms. If all three layers of the artery become weak, it can develop a bulge in it, just like a, if you put too much air in a bicycle tire. If you, if you take a bicycle tire and start pump, pumping air into it, just keep pumping. Eventually it's going to go boom, and there's going to be a thing sticking out. An artery can do the same thing. And so this artery gets your big bulge in it. This is, this is become weakened and makes a big bulge. Now, if this stays put, fine, but if this breaks open, you're in trouble. Because now, if this is an aorta and this bursts, you know, you're going to live about 10 minutes. Now, what sometimes can happen is when you develop these aneurysms, the body will actually, remember the body can remodel. Remodel means it sends in tissue to repair it. It can put, it can change, it can put in a new endothelium. It can form a blood clot. If this, when this first bulges out, blood will be in here. Well, when the blood puts flow in, the blood in here is going to tend to clot. So you'll get a blood clot here. And this might, this, this might totally clot off. And even though the wall of the artery is way out here, this here is going to be a blood clot. Blood's still flowing through the artery, but this, is, this here is clotted. If this, person, if this doesn't bust, the body can re-endothelialize across here, and you'll actually develop like a new, a new artery wall in here, even though this is a blood clot out here. People can have this for 20 and 30 years, and if it doesn't bust, they don't even know, a lot of them don't, don't, don't even know they have it. Sometimes we discover on x-ray by accident, or during a, during, during a catheterization, we put dye in the artery, and you can see this mass, and you go, oh, geez, they didn't, they didn't even know they had that. A, sac, a saccular aneurysm is where all three layers of the artery will bulge out, like this. Here's all the layers of the artery, they all, they're all involved in the bulge. That's a saccular aneurysm. And then you have what's called a dissecting aneurysm, that's different. A dissection is actually more dangerous and it actually hurts more usually. Okay, now here's the layer, let's say this, these are the layers of the artery here. Now, suppose because of artery disease, or it can even be just a mechanical tear, you get a tear, you get a tear in the intima. Now because the artery is built to three layers, you can actually separate those layers if there's enough pressure. So blood comes in and starts going between the layers of the artery. So what happens is you have the, okay now, the endothelium is torn. Blood has gone inside of here and is accumulating between the intima and media, or between the media and adventitia, as normally occurs. It normally, it normally, the smooth muscle tears away, and the blood goes between the adventitia and the media and, di and dissects. Now this area is blood, and here, here's, the ins here's the lining of the artery here, but now the blood is between the layers of the artery, and dissection means as the pressure increases, it tears more and more and more. You ever start peeling the paint off of something and you peel the paint and peel the paint and just peel it? 
as the blood gets in here and forces this, you're actually tearing, tearing the lining away from the artery, and the inside layer is getting further and further away from the outside layer, and blood will actually get between the layers, and this will start ripping, and it can rip all the length of the aorta. It can rip all the way around the aortic arch, it can rip all the way down, and it hurts. It feels like somebody is tearing, tearing your insides out. Very painful. I've had a patient even lean against something that hurt so bad, he was actually pushing his chest against the chair, trying to equalize the sensation because it hurt so bad. He, he thought that it, it was tearing so bad that he wanted to push it, push on it. The guy died in about 10 minutes, but it was terrible. He, he dissected right through his aortic arch. Very dramatic when it happens, it hurts. The pain is typically excruciating, feels like tearing, often radiates to the middle of the back. If you have somebody with chest pain, and I mean, it really hurts bad, and they say it hurts in between their shoulder blades in the middle of the back, man, you gotta take that real seriously, because that could be an aortic dissection. That's the classic symptoms. Tearing pain radiating to the back. The body has tissue autoregulation. That means each part of the body helps determine its own blood flow by its own metabolic needs, and it does that by dilating or constricting its own blood vessels, and as long as the pressure in the core of the body where the aorta is, as long as that pressure is fairly constant, then each part of the body can regulate its own blood flow. And that's how, basically how the body works. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system come into play if the body needs to cut off the, if the body needs to cut off the blood supply to one area to save another area, it can do that. It works on a priority basis. It tries to save the heart and brain first. And the way that it does that is it will constrict the blood flow to other areas that can tolerate ischemia longer. The body knows that the brain and heart cannot tolerate ischemia very well, so the, the body will try to save the heart and brain at all costs. And irreversible shock is when the body cuts off the blood supply to like the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, the, and the intestines so long that they start releasing all these toxic chemicals into the bloodstream and uh, they, they eventually build up to the point to where you will die no matter what. And so all forms of shock will eventually become the same thing. They just start out of different areas. Uh, A and P and B and P. They discovered natriuretic peptides maybe about 25 years ago. Your heart produces a chemical. The heart muscle itself produces a chemical. In the upper chambers of the heart, the atria, they isolated something called atrial natriuretic factor up here. They discovered another one. They discovered another one called brain natriuretic. Uh, it's called BNP, brain natriuretic peptide. These two chemicals basically do the same thing. Even though they call it brain natriuretic peptide, it actually is produced mainly in the ventricle of the heart. So BNP is produced in the ventricles of the heart, and AMP is, ANF is produced in the upper chambers of the heart. They're basically the same chemical, and what they do is, any time that your body is overloaded with fluid for a, for a prolonged period of time, and the key here is prolonged, if, if you drank a gallon of water, but if you have congestive heart failure and your heart doesn't pump well, and you get too much fluid accumulation in your body, and, you're, and there's too much blood coming back to your heart, and your heart gets overloaded with extra blood coming back to it, the, the atria starts getting stretched, and the ventricle starts getting stretched. Remember, too much blood coming into the heart, the frank starting effect can only keep up so long, and then the pressures, the pressures up here start going up, and these muscles start stretching. A little bit of stretch is good, but a, a, too much stretch for a too long period of time is bad. It can actually make the heart fail. So the atria and the ventricles produce a chemical that helps get rid of water. It helps your kidneys diurese water. It helps your blood vessels dilate to reduce preload and afterload. So this, these chemicals are designed to help your body get rid of excess sodium and get rid of excess water. Because remember, sodium follows water. So if the kidney gets rid of sodium, water will follow. So the kidney starts getting rid of water and sodium. And it's called atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natriuretic peptide. That was the original name. What does the word peptide mean? A peptide is the, it's a, it's the linkage. When amino acids are linked together to make a protein molecule, those are called peptide chains or, or peptide linkage. So when you see the word peptide, just think it's a protein molecule. 
So if you see the name of a chemical and it says peptide, that means it's a, it's a protein. Okay, let's talk about oxygen transport. This combines respiratory and, and cardiac together. In your lung, remember airway, 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 airway. We go down to little teeny airways and we're going to look at an, al an alveoli or air sac. In your lung, there's about, uh, I think, 7 to 12 divisions until you get to the point at which you start seeing alveoli up here. Alveoli are very small. You, you, it requires a microscope to see an alve a single alveolus. It's so small, it requires a microscope. They're very small. But we always draw the air sacs to be, to be like a little balloon, just to, so you can picture it. And here's, a, here's one air sac, and we're going to draw the capillary, the capillary going right next to the alveoli. Now, this is coming from the right heart. Right ventricle pumps into the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it goes into the pulmonary capillaries. And then after it goes by the alveoli, then the pulmonary veins keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and they go back to the left heart. So at this level, your oxygen is going to come out of the alveolus and go into the bloodstream. CO2 is going to come out of the bloodstream and go into the alveoli. But the partial pressure of oxygen is higher in the alveoli than it is in the capillary blood. So the, the pressure gradient or the concentration gradient of oxygen supports oxygen from going from the alveoli into the bloodstream. The partial pressure of CO2 is higher in the bloodstream at this point than it is in the alveoli. So CO2 is going to cross a pressure gradient and go from the pulmonary capillary into the alveoli to be exhaled or to be ventilated out. Oxygenation is the process by which oxygen comes in, gets into the blood and goes to the tissue. Ventilation, all ventilation means is once CO2 is in the lungs, you're going to breathe it out. Ventilation is how much gas goes in and out of the lungs and that's basically to get rid of CO2. Oxygen will come in, but when you talk about ventilation, you're basically talking about how to get rid of CO2 by getting air in and out of the lungs. Now, how is oxygen carried from here to the tissue? Red blood cell? Hemoglobin. Right. Hemoglobin is a molecule that's designed to carry oxygen. It's got iron in it, and it's got these little structures called heme, H-E-M-E. -E. And each molecule of hemoglobin has four hemes, and each one can attach an oxygen molecule. So each molecule of hemoglobin can carry four O2 molecules. Some of the oxygen will actually be dissolved in the plasma, but not very much. About 98% of it will be attached to hemoglobin and transported in the hemoglobin. When that red blood cell circulates to whatever tissue needs it, then the oxygen will come off the hemoglobin, go into the tissue, and oxygenate whatever area needs the oxygen. Now, oxygen is actually easier than carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a little bit more complex because carbon dioxide transport has a lot to do with acid-base balance. And I'll give, this, I'll give you the simple version. You know that when, when, when a tissue produces CO2, CO2 diffuses quite easily through the, through the interstitial fluid. It, it goes fairly easily through liquids. So that's like if you have a, if you have a Pepsi or a Coke and it's carbonated. That's just dissolved CO2. CO2 dissolves very easily in liquids. And a carbonated beverage is, what makes it tingly is that's CO2 that's dissolved in the Coke. And when you see the bubbles coming up, that's, that, well, that is the CO2 coming out of, uh, coming out of being dissolved in, into the atmosphere. And that's what carbonation is. So CO2 dissolves fairly quickly into liquids. So but the, when, the, when the tissue produces CO2, it comes out. And when it gets to the blood vessel, it comes in contact with water. So water plus carbon dioxide forms carbonic acid, right? So that what happens is the carbon dioxide can also be carried by the hemoglobin, but when it disassociates into carbonic acid, then that disassociates into free hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. The free hydrogen ions combine with the hemoglobin and are transported on the hemoglobin and as it as the oxygen jumps off it jumps on in fact the carbon dioxide and oxygen kind of trade places there's actually a process by one of them getting on helps the other one get off so this works out really well the bicarbonate diffuses into the bloodstream and just be, becomes it just floats to the bloodstream and, it, and this this acts as a, a as a pH buffer and it's available all the time 
while the hydrogen ions, which is the, which is the acid part, is being transported by the hemoglobin. Now, when this gets to the alveoli of the lung, then the, the reverse process happens. It's converted back this way and is converted into CO2 and H2O. The CO2 now jumps into the alveoli. The CO2 goes into the alveoli, and the next time you exhale, it goes out and you ventilate it out. So acid-base balance and respiratory are, are just like together. You have to understand them at the same time. So that's how the CO2 gets from the tissue through the bloodstream back to the alveoli. It also rides on hemoglobin as a buffer, and it hitches a ride as one gets on, the other one gets off. As the other one gets off, the other one gets on. They actually help each other get back on and off the hemoglobin molecule. Um, now, what you've got to understand is hemoglobin will attach to more things than just oxygen. In fact, it's, it's very partial to carbon monoxide. Okay. Carbon monoxide is extremely toxic to the body. And one of the reasons it's so toxic is because hemoglobin <coughs> likes carbon monoxide 273 times more than oxygen. In other words, if you have, if you have a hemoglobin, red blood cell, hemoglobin, if you have X amount of O2 here and, and X amount of carbon monoxide here, carbon monoxide will get on that 273 times more easily than the, than the oxygen. I mean, than the, yeah, than the oxygen. So, if you have carbon monoxide, it's going to totally knock the oxygen off and take a ride on it, and it will occupy all the spaces where the oxygen can get on, and oxygen can't get on now. So the person will basically die an ischemic death just because the oxygen can't take a ride on the hemoglobin. So if someone has carbon monoxide poisoning, their hemoglobin is saturated with the wrong gas, and it, it won't provide oxygen for, to make ATP in the cell, so basically you just die. Very bad way to die. A lot of things have to be necessary to get the right amount of oxygen to the tissue. How much oxygen is in the air? 21%. Your, this atmosphere contains about 21% oxygen. Now, hypoperfusion uh, and shock have many different ideologies. In other words, they can start in different areas. But once they get started, they all do the same thing, like in my shock chart I showed you. But they can start in different areas. So. We talked about different forms of shock. We'll, we'll quickly touch on different forms of shock. So the classic that we talked about already is hypovolemic. What are some causes of hypovolemic shock? Blood loss, diarrhea, all these things. Blood loss, burns, vomiting, diarrhea, sweating too much, peeing too much, di people taking too much diuretics. There's all kinds of reasons. Uh, diabetes, diabetes. Why does diabetes cause hypovolemic shock? The sugar acts just like a diuretic. You've heard of Lasix, it's a drug makes you pee. Sugar will do the same thing. If your blood sugar is too high, remember the, remember the kidney, the nephron. You have a little thing called the glomerulus. Remember the glomerulus. And then you have Bowman's capsule out here. And then you have the tubules, you have Lupa Henle. Then you have a bunch more, and then it goes to the, to the pee, right? When sugar, when sugar goes into the filtrate, the glomerular filtration, that sugar acts just like a diuretic. You have a lot of sugar here. So the partial pressure of sugar is higher in the filtrate. The sugar displaces some of them, so the water molecules are gonna go from a higher concentration of water molecules to a lower concentration of water molecules. So the water's gonna to go towards the sugar. Just put this in the kidney, here's the filtrate, water's gonna follow the sugar. So if your blood sugar goes up, the sugar goes into the kidney, you start spilling sugar into the urine, Water follows it, you start peeing like a racehorse. <coughs> so people that have a high blood sugar urinate crazily, and they can become extremely dehydrated. If you become dehydrated enough, you go into hypovolemic shock, just like, it, just like it did blood. In the aortic arch, and in the carotid sinus, you have pressure receptors, they're called baroreceptors. These baroreceptors, they feel the pressure starting to drop in your arteries. They tell your brain that something's gone wrong. That sends messages down the sympathetic nervous system. It tells the sympathetic nervous system to constrict the blood vessels, to make the total space available for blood to reduce. You want to, you want to shrink the system because now you have less blood to fill it. When that happens, you're trying to fill up the relative volume of the reduced blood volume. So the sympathetic nervous system becomes activated. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are secreted. Norepinephrine is secreted by the sympathetic neurons 
Epinephrine and norepinephrine are secreted by the adrenal medulla. It goes everywhere the blood goes. It also makes the heart rate increase. Why does the heart rate increase? Trying to maintain mean arterial pressure. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any more cardiac output go up. It tries to maintain aortic root pressure so the system can perfuse the important blood vessels. Also, when you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, and because of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, remember the kidney, you have that little thing called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, right? When that senses the change in the concentration of electrolytes in the urine filtrate, it releases renin into the bloodstream. The renin, is a, it's nothing but a proteolytic enzyme. It, it changes angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1, when it circulates to the lungs, it comes in contact with angiotensin converting enzyme. That changes angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. That causes profound effects. It causes vasoconstriction, causes the heart rate increase. It goes to the adrenal cortex, causes the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone further causes the kidney to reduce the urinary output, causes the kidney to retain salt, to retain water, and not to get rid of that stuff because you want to build your blood volume back up. Okay, what's the difference between compensated and un uncompensated shock? If you don't bleed too much, peripheral vasoconstriction, along with clamping down on the venous system, trying to get more re venous return, and, and, blood, uh, and water diffusing into the bloodstream from other areas that the body uses for storing fluids. The body will try to restore some of the blood volume just by fluid coming out of the interstitial space into, into the bloodstream. And if, if you haven't bled too much, the body can compensate by constricting the blood vessels, increasing the heart rate to maintain mean arterial pressure, reducing urinary output to, to save whatever fluid is left, and that person can survive if you can correct the underlying problem and rehydrate the person or give blood transfusions. That's compensated shock. Decompensated shock is where the person, if you lose, too, if you lose more than a critical amount and the body can no longer maintain sufficient aortic root pressure and the, and the arterial pressure even in the aortic root drops below like 70 then what happens is you rapidly lose perfusion to the heart, brain and other vital areas and then you go into a vicious cycle and all hope is lost basically so you got to, that, that's what the golden hour, golden hour is all about you have to correct the problem before it gets to that point burns, burns do a similar thing but the, the problem with burns is they don't you, don't, you don't lose a lot of red cells, at, at least externally to the body. A lot of them actually hemolyze because of the burn injury. But you lose a tremendous amount of, of circulating liquid volume because you lose the integrity of the skin. And when the skin is burnt and, there, and the skin can no longer hold the fluid where it's supposed to be, you have what's called third spacing. Liquid leaves the, the vascular space to try to infiltrate the burn area, and the burn area actually starts losing fluid to the outside of the body, and it's just like you're peeing constantly, and the person can become hypovolemic really quick. Uh, neurogenic shock, let's talk about neurogenic shock. What causes neurogenic shock? Spinal cord injury. Now, why would a spinal cord injury cause shock? So the message has to go down the spinal cord to get to the what's called the thoracolumbar sympathetic chain, where the message goes out to the sympathetic chain, sends out the message to the norepinephrine to constrict the blood vessels. If you transect the spinal cord, then the sympathetic system doesn't work. The sympathetic nerve system can no longer send out the norepinephrine through the sympathetic nerves, and so now the vascular tone, your blood vessels all dilate. You lose your normal sympathetic tone. Your, your blood vessels lose the ability to regulate their diameter and they all get big. When that happens, your body cannot adjust the peripheral vascular resistance to minute-to-minute -minute changes in the cardiac output and your vascular tone drops out the bottom and your blood vessels dilate. So now, if you were standing up and that happened, you would faint. But if you have a transected spinal cord, I guarantee you're probably going to be laying down anyway. You're not going to be walking around. So with a spinal cord injury that causes that you, will, you won't be walking around. Because before you lose the sympathetic chain, you're all, if you lose enough spinal cord to cut that out, you're also going to lose muscular tone and ability to move. So these people will normally be paralyzed. 
But if you don't recognize the fact that they can have a neurogenic shock, um, you need to be careful because if this person gets if this person gets tilted up too high, then it can cause them to faint. You don't normally you don't normally die of neurogenic shock unless you're stuck in a position where you can't be laid, laid flat. Because if you lay the person flat, normally the venous return will be sufficient to cause enough cardiac output where the blood pressure will be enough to sustain life. Neurogenic shock normally is not a fatal as much as like hypovolemic shock. And over time, over, over time, the body will regain the ability to use the adrenal medulla and other things and fluid retention to increase cardiac output. That's why people that are paralyzed go around in wheelchairs, set up fine. They can even, they can even stand up with help and, and go through rehab. Even if their spinal cord doesn't work properly, a lot of these people can be brought upright because other parts of the body will take over adrenal medulla, fluid retention, and adaptations in the vascular tone that are local and not controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. Anaphylactic shock. We've talked about someone that had a lot of IgE antibodies. The IgE antibody titers high. They have something they're, they're sensitized to. The, anti the antigen antibody reaction causes mast cell degranulation. Remember, the mast cells has histamine, serotonin, prostaglandin, leukotrienes, bradykinin, all these things, all these chemicals that are vasoactive. They cause some vascular beds to dilate. They cause other vascular beds to constrict. Usually, it's a, it's a big mess. They, their, their peripheral vascular resistance drops drastically. Because of the effects of histamine and because of the effects of bradykinin, they go into bronchospasm. They, they can start wheezing. Uh, they can have difficulty breathing. Their tongue can swell up. Uh, they look terrible. True anaphylactic shock can be rapidly fatal. So these people have to be dealt with very quickly. Obviously, put them in shock position. And it's important to start an IV as quickly as you can because if you get there real quick, you may still have a vein to start an IV on. But if you don't get an IV quickly, bad things start to happen to where it's going to be difficult to get an IV. Number one, as their blood pressure drops and their peripheral vascular resistance drops, the veins that you did see a minute ago are going to go away because now there's, there's very little fluid to fill the veins. So where you might have seen a vein before, now there's, their skin is pale and clammy, and you, and you cannot find a vein. So now that you need to give them fluids, you may not have a way to give them fluids. So get an IV as fast as you can, and uh, make sure they have 100% uh, oxygen, and they're going to require medication. If they're, not, if, they're not, if they're an anaphylactic shock, they're going to require some sort of medicine. Epinephrine is the most effective, the most rapidly effective, and is the central core of treatment. While you may give them other things too, like corticosteroids or Benadryl, those are not the life-saving things. The epinephrine is the life-saving drug, and that's the one they need to give. Yeah. Most bacteria can be divided into two big families. Now, they don't all fit in these two families, but most of them are either gram-negative or gram-positive. And they're called this because of the way they react to a stain, called a gram stain. If, if, the, if they're, the gram stain is absorbed by the cell wall, it's called gram positive, and they tend to look purple under the microscope. If they don't absorb the gram stain, then they have to be stained by an alternative method, which makes them look pink. So you can kind of tell by, by the way the slide looks, whether it's gram positive or gram negative by the color. If it's purple, it's gram positive. If it's pink, it's usually gram negative. There are exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. The difference between these is significant because the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria has a sequence in it that's called endotox endotoxin. The cell wall of the bacteria itself is a toxic substance to the body. And it's even more toxic when the bacteria dies. And the bacteria is alive, of course, it's bad because you have bacterial infection. But when the bacteria dies and breaks apart, then the cell wall is a specific toxin called endotoxin. And endo, gram-negative endotoxin is very damaging to the, to the body's, to your, to your cardiovascular system. It causes a form of shock called toxic shock syndrome. No matter how you get a gram-negative infection, it's significant because the, the bacteria itself can cause septic shock.
and it's called it's called myocardial toxic factor. It's got several things. Also called tumor necrosis factor. When you go into septic shock, some of these factors that come from bacteria can actually poison the body's ability to regulate blood flow. It causes vasodilation and, and, and vascular beds that ought to be constricted. It causes constriction and vascular beds that ought to be dilated. In other words, it totally screws up the body's ability to auto-regulate blood flow. And it just kind of creates vicious cycles. It's just a mess. And it's septic shock. And um, if you have a gram-positive infection, the cell wall is different. The cell wall doesn't have endotoxin in it, but the bacteria itself can become toxic. So you can, you can get septic shock from gram-negative or gram-positive, although it's more common in gram-positive infections because of the myocardial toxic factor. The classic example is somebody with a kidney infection or, or an ammonia, and they, they typically, the most typical scenario is an elderly person who has a kidney infection or urinary tract infection with gram-negative bacteria. The urinary tract infection is chronic, doesn't get treated well, the person doesn't have good medical care, um, they're often in nursing homes, and they have this terrible infection in the urinary tract, and they go into septic shock and die. This causes a lot of deaths in nursing homes. But that is a common form of septic shock. Uh, pneumonia often leads to septic shock. Uh, typically in septic shock, they're vasodilated. Their cardiac output is normal because they become something called hyperdynamic. In septic shock, you're, you're normally warm. You don't get cold and clammy normally. Your skin color is usually pretty good. You don't get vasoconstricted because your sympathetic nervous system doesn't get activated because your blood pressure is normal. There's no reason for your sympathetic nervous system to kick in because your blood pressure doesn't drop. Your blood pressure is normal. The bacteria are causing the, the vasodilation. So your skin stays nice and warm. Your body temperature is often elevated. So the person normally has good pulses. Their, their skin may be warm. It's not normally clammy. Skin may be warm, but their blood pressure will drop as they become more and more vasodilated, as the system becomes poisoned with the toxins. Okay, multi-system organ dysfunction. This is just a, what happens is, if you have a lot of organ systems that are all failing at once, they just release so much junk into the system that it can it causes syndrome that's hard to recover from right and going down. What's a prion? You see, it says bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, prions. What's a prion? There's only one disease that, that you'll ever see that, that is a prion disease. Prions are smaller than viruses. Yeah, they're real, they're real small. They're actually smaller than viruses. They act, they're actually less alive. Than, they're not really alive at all. They're actually sequences. Of, there's only one disease associated with prions that you've probably ever heard of. Mad cow disease. Oh, yeah. Yeah, zombies. Mad cow disease is a prion disease. You'll probably never see a prion disease in your career. You can actually get a prion disease is so bizarre. If you ever want to think about life, what what here okay, we all know we're alive and we say we're pretty good with us being alive. Then you think about bacteria and say, well, they don't have a brain. But yet everything else we associate with being alive they have, except they don't think. So that they, they obviously bacteria probably don't have consciousness as we perceive it, but yet we would still say the bacteria are alive. Then you get to viruses. And you go, virus, it can't reproduce itself. It has to use your it has to use your cell to reproduce, because viruses can't reproduce. Viruses only become functional when they're inside another type of life, and then they use that cell's DNA and RNA and ribosomes to reproduce, and then they use your uh, genome to replicate. They use your genome to store their information. So are they alive? No, because if they couldn't get inside, if, you were, if they were sitting there on a table, they couldn't do anything ever. They just sit there. They only become a problem when they get inside the machinery of your cell. So now you're on the borderline of whether something's alive or not. And then you get the prions. Prions even aren't, even aren't that sophisticated. They're just a certain chemical sequence. It's like a, it's like a protein code 
And if something's got like a mad cow disease and you eat the tissue from the mad cow, that code can actually come in and, and remodel the shape of your proteins. And when it remodels the shape of your proteins, it can actually kill you if you get enough of your proteins that are, aren't the right shape. Are they alive? No. I mean, but, but where do you draw the line? I mean, there's, there's, if you look at what life is or way we understand life, there, there's a gradual, you know, in, in, it's not like this is alive and this isn't alive. There's a gradual line. You go, where, where do we draw the line on where life is? Very, the more you learn, the more difficult it becomes. Very hmm. What about parasites? Parasites are basically anything that live off of another. A, paras yeah. a parasite could be a bacteria, it could be a. It could be. There's all kinds of different parasites. A parasite is a non technical, non specific term for something that lives inside of you that's damaging. Now, some. Well, I, they're not always damaging. Some parasites are synergistic and can actually help certain species. But if you see it in this context, it's usually a parasite that causes um, a problem. See how worms can be parasites? There's all kinds of nasty. There's one, it, you don't see it in this country, but there's one place, I think the Zambezi River or something, where this thing oh, it up. It swims up and gets inside your ankle, and then, and then it, it, it gets in your blood and it multiplies, and then it goes down in your ankle and makes this big pus pocket in the blood vessels in your ankle. And then it sits there and waits. And then the next time, the next time you're in the creek, it, it somehow knows you're in the creek, and it busts out of your skin and jumps back in the water. It's, it's creepy. It's almost like alien. You know, that that blows up your pee if you can. Exotoxins are normally associated with gram positive, and they have to do with what's secreted by the bacteria. The uh, endotoxin triggers inflammation. Is normally part of the gram negative cell wall. Septicemia is a non-specific term that just means you're you're, you're infected, and it's the, the infection is causing systemic illness. Viruses are the cause of most infections. They're much more common than bacteria. When you go to the doctor because you have a cold, and I, I, I tend to harp on this, when you get a cold and go to the doctor and you want an antibiotic, the first thing you can do, uh, it's, it's a, something called an adenovirus or rhinovirus. If you mainly have a stuffy nose, it's usually an adenovirus. If you normally have a sore throat, it's usually, I mean, um, if you have a stuffy nose, it's usually a rhinovirus. If you have a sore throat, it's usually an adenovirus. There's about 120 of those. There's about 100 rhinoviruses, like 120 adenoviruses. In your lifetime, you will not get the same one twice. Every time you have a cold, it's a different virus. Now, they're, they're closely related, and they're often mutations that originated from one of the other ones. But you will never get the exact same cold twice because of the, the remember, the immune system remembers those guys, and they build those clones. And if, if the same cold virus tries to come back, it'll never become clinical because your body recognizes it and won't let it get going. But you, there, there's plenty of viruses for you to have one every year for the rest of your life. And, and, and what they are is it's usually a protein coat, and on the inside are nucleic acids. And that's, that's what they have, to, they have to basically come in, they land on your cell, they inject, their DNA or RNA, depending. Some some viruses are DNA, some are RNA, some are double stranded, some are single stranded, and some have something called reverse transcriptase, where they can actually do genetics backwards, which is real interesting. But they can actually inject their chromosome into you. It goes into your nucleus. It encodes its own chromosome into yours. Your 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 chromosome or your um, your genome has encoded into it the sequences of all the viruses you've had in your life because your viruses actually insert their own genome into your genome. So you could actually, once computers get better, if you have your entire genome sequenced and they put that into a supercomputer, there will be a time to where they will know every sequence of every disease and the computer could tell you basically every virus you've had by, by the sequence of your DNA because it inserts its own into yours. So they put their instructions inside your from inside your DNA. Like I said, viruses only work if they're inside of something. They don't work on their own. A virus, you know, you cannot infect a, a table with a virus. Viruses will die if they don't get inside of something within a short period of time. 
Viruses are easier to kill. Uh, people always just be worried about AIDS. You know, can I, if somebody with AIDS has touched something, can I touch something? You know, viruses don't live very long on environmental surfaces and are easy to kill. They're much easier to kill than bacteria. Some bacteria are fairly easy to kill. Some bacteria are hard as get out to kill. Some bacteria are almost impossible to kill. Uh, in 1967, NASA, land, NASA landed on the moon with something called Surveyor. And Surveyor was a little unmanned thing that landed on the moon. When Apollo 12 went to the moon, they landed like 100 yards from Surveyor because they wanted to, because first of all, they thought it was cool. And, and another thing they landed by Surveyor, and the astronauts, the astronauts went over there and took parts of Surveyor back to the Earth to examine because they knew that had been on the moon for three years. When they got back to the laboratory, under sterile conditions, they swabbed the inside of one of the cameras on Surveyor that had been on the moon for three years. Now, to understand why this is so cool, the moon has no atmosphere, and it also has no magnetic field. So the moon does not protect anything from radiation. It gets all the radiation, all the ultraviolet radiation, all the gamma rays, and there's no protection on the moon from radiation. And that's why you can't live on the moon very long unless you have special protection because there's a lot of radiation. So they took back this camera from the surveyor and they swabbed the camera lens and put it on a culture disc and they grew, they grew bacteria that had been alive on the moon for three years with no atmosphere, no oxygen, and all that radiation. So bacteria can be pretty hardy. Okay, most spongy, like yeast and molds, don't cause a lot of problems, although mold can cause an allergic reaction in people. If you develop an allergic reaction to acetylcholine receptors, your immune system attacks your acetylcholine receptors. That's what myasthenia gravis is. It causes muscle weakness, fasciculations, and eventually it can cause paralysis. But that's, your body attacks your acetylcholine receptors, and so your your nerves that go to your muscles will no longer work. Thrombocytopenic purpura is a clotting disorder. You can get big purple splotches on you, look like big bruises. What's systemic lupus erythematosus? Lupus, everybody's heard of lupus. What is lupus? You hear about it all the time on the news. It attacks connected, it's a connected tissue disorder. Connect, it attacks connected tissue. You have connected tissue everywhere. Ligaments, tendons, uh, this, the, the connective tissue and the skin. Uh, yeah, seal had it, that's why it's scarred in this case. Yeah.